um, U.S. GAAP accounting, there are a lot of non-cash P&L charges that hit the income statement. So at one level, while we talk a lot about our GAAP income statement, our U.S. generally accepted accounting principles reported earnings per share, and we give you information to measure us there, there are other ways to look at our income statement that take out and, and reflect some of the non-cash charges, and I'm going to show you that as well. And it's interesting, um, there were a number of you that were here last year. If you go back to last year, we had not yet even delivered our first major milestone, which was Q4, the June quarter gap operating income of at least 4%, and we did that and you know, actually blew beyond that number. So um, the analysts and shareholders care a lot about this. It is a fairly extensive level of detail, but it gives you a sense of, of many of the things that we have to manage and keep track of as well. So I'm going to show you a slightly different representation of this. And um, uh, at the end of our uh, September quarter, we introduced a new non-GAAP measure that we called adjusted EBITDA. And EBITDA stands for Earnings Before Interest, Taxes, Depreciation, and Amortization. Many companies report an EBITDA number. It's not one that we have totally made up, and that acronym sort of rolls off your, your tongue after a while. But what this does is takes the GAAP operating income statement, adds back, and shows some of the non-cash P&L charges, and really shows a fundamentally different picture of the cash generating capability of the company. And at the end of the day, shareholders buy stocks because there's a compelling vision and value proposition, because there's a growth rate that's important to them, and because at the end of the day, the business generates cash. That's the ultimate return to shareholders. That's the ultimate scorecard. And this helps people see that and understand it in, 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 in addition to, if you will, the gap operating numbers. So again, what you can see on here is big improvement over the last couple of years. <coughs> what I also show on here, in this section and in this section, is essentially a couple of different scenarios, and, and they are scenarios, they're not guidance per se, but there are a couple different ways of looking at the income statement. So for fiscal 08, which we're in now, what those scenarios represent is low to mid single digit revenue growth, which is what we said we we're going to go do. It shows a couple of different gross margin scenarios, etc., beneath that, but it also shows a number of non um, um, cash charges, and when you add them back, it's a significant um, cash generating capability. And then what it shows again next year is if you just compound that growth by the numbers that are listed up there, it will generate even more cash. And that's generally speaking a proxy for where we are headed. Not specific guidance, but, but that gives you a sense of where we're headed. And that's a very impressive chart, and that means a lot to people that are looking at the company as the fundamental underlying health of, of the business. So a couple other things that are going on in terms of cash flow. <coughs> I might talk a bit more about my SQL as well, but um, we have, um, uh, it shows on here that we have been buying back stock. The board authorized a $3 billion stock buyback at the end of December. We had bought back over $2.2 billion of that, so we have about $800 million left. We will buy that stock back, you know, over the coming um, months and quarters. Uh, you know, at the end of every quarter we, we tell you how much we've done, but we plan to go do that. We also are going to be funding a big portion of the MySQL purchase with cash. And then we will continue to generate cash from operations and have certain capital expenditures, and, and that gives you a sense of that. So what does that look like? There's another way to look at this as well, for those of you that are really cash students. There, there's a, a number called cash flow from operations, but then when you deduct capital expenses, there's something called free cash flow, which is listed down here. And again, it sort of cuts through all this stuff, right? It says, is this company really generating cash? Forget, are they making money on a gap basis, which we are. What this really shows is that this is generating a lot of cash. This is where the value continues to come from, and this is very important to people. So I know I'm kind of blown through this, but, but I think you get the message. When you think about our financial model, we're more focused on a, a similar set of meters at Sun right now. What's the total number of customers we have? 
not software customers, hardware customers, service customers, total number of customers. Secondarily, what's the average revenue per customer? Because we'd like to see that over time go up. What does it cost us to capture a customer? Um, that's the way we think about our acquisition strategy. Can you help us grow the number of customers? Can you help us grow the, the margin dollars, or the average revenue per customer? Can you help us capture them more efficiently? And that's increasingly how we run Sun. The core meters we care about are ultimately what Mike put up on that stage, which is the adjusted EBITDA of the company, which is the underlying organic profitability of Sun. And if you look at those numbers over the past few years, you'll see, you'll see a very aggressive growth in the key meters we care about. The most interesting one to non-financial uh, 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 you know, folks who are not simply focused on financials is the number of new customers we're gaining. And we're gaining them in those economies that are emerging most rapidly to become forces on the internet. And uh, a couple things to think about. Um, you know, this was a point that was actually made in this room at a panel we did. If you think of Sun as a media company, um, and that's just, it's an interesting thought experiment, but fundamentally, open source software is a collision of old world technology and new world media. Um, you know, what is an app server? Glassfish is as much a social network as it is a technology platform. Um, if you think about where those communities will grow, they will grow among those that consume media, who are open to change, who want to join a technology community. Dominantly, that's going to be among a very specific portion of the world's age group, because when you get to our collective ages in this room, we tend not to be big media buyers anymore. You know, we all bought music, some of us borrowed music, when we were in college. And as you graduate out of that, your preferences become fixed, your social networks become a little bit more rigid. So if you look at the places in the world that are graduating the majority of uh, consumers of media, at the majority of new engineers, new startups, new uh, people open to change, there are places that have the largest populations in the world. So the population centers are increasingly becoming the technology centers. Because again, if you're going to build a social network in the United States, wild success will be 60 million people. If you're going to build a social network in India, you know, you just, it's nothing. It's like a neighborhood. So as we build out our marketplace, our market is going to be a derivative of where we see uh, you know, cooperative governments that understand the value and opportunity of connecting their society to the global economy. Um, those that have academic environments that produce high quality engineers and high quality talent. Um, those that are interested in building their economies using technology as opposed to using simply labor. And that, I think, you know, where, who, who in the world isn't like that? You know, what countries aren't uh, presuming they're going to leverage the network to go build their economies? I mean, the U.S. is a, a it's about 40% of our revenue today. Um, you know, not to make a, 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 a a forecast about where things head. If the rest of the world grows more rapidly than the U.S., the U.S. will become a smaller percentage of our overall revenue. And right now, we see the rest of the world growing much more rapidly. 